within the RSS and many sections of the BJP, I dare say, there is a strong feeling that the kind of uh, uh, one rule, one man rule within the BJP has become unproductive for the party's long-term interests. The RSS is worried including sections of the BJC, BJP about a certain Frankenstein monster that has been unleashed by Prime Minister Modi's BJP rule for the last 10 years. And that is a section of the Sangh Parivar which consists entirely or largely of Lumpun elements who are a law unto themselves whose who are, in a sense, intoxicated by the power of the state which protects them and which are not under the writ of either the BJP and much less the RSS. Now, how do you control this group of Andhabhaks or Lumpun elements in trying to bring restraint and sanity to a party which must run its five-year tenure if it hopes to do that with consensus, with restraint, with respect for diversity, for tolerance. I that know. is what the RSS is thinking about. Hello and welcome to a special interview for The Wire. If there is one person whom Narendra Modi and the BJP hold in high esteem and whose advice they are likely to heed, it's the Sangh Sarchalak of the Rashtriya Swam Sevak Sangh Mohan Bhagwat. When the Sangh Sarchalak speaks, the Prime Minister and the BJP are likely to listen. And that is precisely what the Sangh Sarchalak did last Monday in what many have interpreted as a subtle but telling critique of the Prime Minister and the BJP. So how should the rest of us view that critical speech? That's the key issue I shall raise today with the well-known and highly regarded diplomat author and former Rajya Sabha MP, Pavan Varma. Mr. Varma, in an article you've written for First Post, you said RSS Sangsak Chalak's Mohan Bhagwat's recent speech in Nagpur delivered what you called a pointed and relevant message and was of seminal importance. Before I come to details, let me ask you, why do you believe this was a seminally important speech? First of all, two disclaimers, Karan. I am not an insider of the BJP and the RSS. And it is not my intention to presume that there is in, indeed between them a situation of conflict because essentially they are joined at the hip. But it is a reference I make as someone in politics and as a commentator. I call it seminal uh, or extremely important because Mohan Bhagwat, you may have noticed, uh, speaks rarely. Uh, and when he does, he usually does so with a purpose and a carefully thought out message. I think after the results of the last national elections, uh, people were waiting for his reaction. And uh, he made some several central points which I think were of great importance for the combined BJP RSS Sangh Parivar. Let me get into details at this point. To begin with, the speech seemed to convey a message to the government about how different communities, including minorities, must be treated. Mohan Bhagwat said, and I'm quoting him, respect diversity, live together and respect others too. He also spoke of the need to embrace goodwill to all. Do you think he had the BJP and Mr. Modi's campaign comments about Muslims in mind? You see, there is an important 
difference between the BJP and the RSS that we must, in my view, understand to begin with. The RSS thinks long term. It is a cultural organization, but to deny the fact that it is also one that thinks politically in the long run would, I think, be to deny the truth. In fact, there is a very well-established institutional mechanism for consultation and coordination between the RSS and the BJP and an inter exchangeability of RSS cadres with the BJP. Sure, that but is understood. That is understood. But, but when the Sancha Chala talked about respecting diversity, living together, respecting others too, when he talked about embracing goodwill to all, do you think he had at the back of his mind the comments made by Mr. Modi and the BJP about Muslims during the campaign? Yes, so I was coming to that. So, therefore, the RSS thinks long term. And for some time now, it has been my feeling that the RSS has been uh, a little perturbed about the excessively exclusionist policy of the BJP in power. You will recall, uh, Karan, that Mohan Bhagwaji had uh, made an initiative to meet with five leading Muslim intellectuals. After that, he visited a masjid and visited a madarsa. Uh, when he did so, to the surprise of many, he was uh, rather viciously trolled not by the opposition, but by the ultra-right supporters of the BJP for having committed an act of betrayal. So, first point is that the RSS believes in the Hindutva project, but it believes it is unsustainable in the long run by a policy of extreme exclusionism where you literally, in a sense, uh, exclude from the vision of Bharat uh, the largest minority and possibly other minorities as well. It is not part of the RSS vision, although their project continues, their core project continues to be Hindutva. So that was one factor. Secondly, in this campaign, and in the elections of the past, we must have a, a certain perspective in our mind. 2014, Prime Minister Modi came on the promise of hope. 2019 of continuity. But during this period, certain statements, certain actions, certain policies seem to be very, very uh, polarizing, communalizing, of excluding India's largest minority. But since Mr. Modi came with absolute majorities, the RSS was perhaps in some disquiet but dormant because essentially Mr. Modi and a BJP government with an absolute majority helps in the fulfillment of the RSS core agenda. But once Mr. Modi's invincibility was under question, and in spite of a slogan of Charso Par, he could not even get a majority and uh, uh, did not do as well as many thought, and uh, certainly he must have thought. The RSS came out especially keeping in mind the last phases of the election with Prime Minister Modi, statements became one of, in my view, extreme polarization, a kind of fear-mongering about the Muslims. And that, I think, and the result prompted 
Mohan Bhagwat to make the statements which were in the mind of the RSS, these concerns even earlier. But okay. this was the occasion for him to voice it. There's a particularly striking sentence in Mohan Bhagwat's speech, which you quote in your own article. He said, and I'm now quoting Mohan Bhagwat, we need to reflect on the teachings of Prophet Muhammad and Jesus Christ. And then Mr. Bhagwat pointedly added, we must treat the sons of our country as brothers. Was he saying that Muslims are brothers, not infiltrators, as Mr. Modi had claimed? Now, that sentence is explicitly clear. He has also mentioned in that sentence that in the practice of these religions, perhaps, as in other religions, some distortions have crept in. And they should be rectified or discussed upon. But we must respect all citizens irrespective of their religion as citizens of India and of Bharat. Now, I can rarely think of a more pointed statement as against the one made by Mr. Modi, where he went to the extent in Barmer of insinuating that Muslims were all infiltrators. And you see, remember one thing. Sorry, as I go, I, I am talking also of the RSS, my, my understanding of the RSS philosophy. The RSS philosophy would like the angst, some of the relevant angst of the Hindus to be rectified. They would like to end minority appeals. They may perhaps even like for India to become more culturally rooted in its ancient past and therefore more Hindu by definition than so variously cosmopolitan. True. But they do not want the endemic instability that comes with constant communal strife because they believe that is not good for India. So, so there was a clear message there to Mr. Modi, wasn't there? I would think so. I, this is my view. Because uh, to say very categorically uh, that uh, treat the sons of our country as brothers in the context of Islam and Christianity. Now, it's not as if the RSS does not have its hardcore supporters. We are aware of the Graham Stains murder. We are aware of churches being vandalized and so on and so forth. But on the whole, the RSS would like for its agenda to be pursued by a government, the political wing of the RSS, which is the BJP, which is less divisive. And now, even more importantly, divisive with diminishing returns. Now, there were sections of Mr. Bhagwat's speech that have been widely interpreted as comments that seem to be directed at the Prime Minister specifically, although, of course, Mr. Bhagwat never named the Prime Minister at all. You quote some of those sections in your article. Bhagwat said, a true sevak does not have ahankar or arrogance. He said, jo karma karta hai, par karma mein lipat nahi hota, usme ahankar nahi hota, which translated in English is only he who practices karma but does so selflessly without an ego deserves to be called a true sevak. In your first post article, you call this a particularly telling sentence. Can you explain further to the audience why you believe this is particularly telling? No, because... Uh... I think the statement was generic, but it was directed at a perceived feeling. It was directed at your voice is fading away. The RSS that Pavan, Pavan, can you repeat what you said? Your voice is fading BJP away. Has... Pavan, your voice is fading oh, away. Can you begin that answer again? I think what uh, Mr. Mohan Bhagwat said was generic. The inference was very clear at whom it was specifically directed because for some time now the RSS has been witnessing within the BJP 
a personality cult of an order which is quite alien to the functioning, the collegial functioning, if I may call it, in within the BJP and between the BJP and the RSS. If you recall, Karan, during Atal Bihari Vajpayee's term as Prime Minister, there was Advani ji, there was Murli Manohar Jashri ji, there were consultations, there were discussions during cabinet meetings, there was opposition too. Yes, there were differences between RSS Chief K. Sudarshan and Atal Bihari Vajpayee, but there were forums to discuss it. And these tensions occasionally are not new. But the manner in which the personality cult has become so absolute in the last 10 years is something that the RSS neither approves of because it's a utilitarian reason, Karan. Because it ultimately leads to choices which have not undergone interrogation and scrutiny. In Policies other which have not been in adequately other words, consulted. Are you saying that the RSS has serious reservations, serious concerns about the enormous personality cult that has been deliberately built around Prime Minister Modi? The fact that he refers to himself only in the third person, the fact that the brochure and manifesto was called Modi Ki Guarantee, the fact that the BJP went around saying not only will we get 370 seats, but they added to that, I got to Modi. Is that all of that? Irking the RSS. Not only irking the RSS, Karan, in my view, again, this is an infant, irking the many, many sections of the BJP. Because if the party is more or less invisibilized and the entire campaign is carried out in the name of Modi and the manifesto is also called Modi Ki Guarantee, somewhere. I think it demoralizes cadres. And if you saw the critique by another senior RSS functionary who wrote in the RSS, some would call it mouthpiece organizer, I'm talking of Ratan Sharda, he said that the notion that Mr. Modi will fight on all 342 seats is uh, unworkable. You have to carry others along. And also, when you come to any election or as a leader of a party, with this kind of absolute, unquestionable, unchallenged personality cult, then you make choices on candidates, on the manner in which you deal with senior BJP leaders, on the manner in which you admit outsiders at the cost of BJP leaders and which have proved not to be very efficacious, and the manner in which you demoralize the very cadres who are working for you, and the manner in which you ensure that the cadres may be demoralized, but the Muslims voted en masse against the government when the government could easily have tried to make some forays towards them. But you demonize an entire community and then say, I've done triple talaq for the women. It doesn't work like that. And I think somewhere the RSS understands. Let me ask you this. If the RSS has such serious objections to the personality cult around Mr. Modi, the way he refers to himself, the way he's treated by the BJP, the fact that the manifesto is blatantly called Modi Ki Guarantee, in that event, how do you think Mr. Bhagwat would view Mr. Modi's claim that he's not of biological birth, that he was sent by God to do God's work? Well, you know, I, it all comes under the rubric of ahankar, of ego. And if I may add of that, Mr. Bhagwat, Mr. More You're breaking up again, Pavan. Can you begin your answer again? Within the BJP. Pavan, please begin your because, answer again. Your voice is yeah. breaking up. I think that this aspect of the personality cult and ahankar as perceived by many of the Prime Minister, the final straw on the camel's back was that statement. 
where he says, I don't think I have been biologically born, but have come uh, by a divine process. So, I mean, there is a context in which Mr. Bhagavad also spoke. And let me add to this another problem, which I think will be that of the future. Two things. Because when Mr. Bhagavad is speaking about carrying everybody along, of coexistence, of accepting diversity, of sehmati, building consensus, here is a situation where Mr. Modi is for the first time heading a coalition government. He has neither experience or exposure or an instinctive temperament to do that. In Gujarat, he was the unquestioned chief minister. Since he came to Delhi, he has been the unquestioned absolute majority back prime minister. Now he has to run a coalition. And what I think Mr. Bhagwat was saying is, in doing so, you have to accept some of the, the, you have to accept the importance of differences of opinion, of working towards a consensus, of giving up the position of my way or the highway, of living with diversity. This also is an essential message. And lastly, I, I feel that in this context, I think that Mr. RSS is worried, including sections of the BJC, BJP, about a certain Frankenstein monster that has been unleashed by Prime Minister Modi's BJP rule for the last 10 years. And that is a section of the Sangh Parivar, which consists entirely or largely of lumpen elements, who are a law unto themselves, whose, who are in a sense intoxicated by the power of the state which protects them, and which are not under the writ of either the BJP and much less the RSS. Now, how do you control this group of andhabhaks or lumpen elements in trying to bring restraint and sanity to a party which must run its five-year tenure, if it hopes to do that, with consensus, with restraint, with respect for diversity, for tolerance? And that you, is what the RSS is thinking about. You're saying something very important there. You described it as a Frankenstein monster, but you were talking about the unleashing of lumpen elements who are not looked upon favorably by the RSS, who attack and beat up Muslims, but attack and beat up others as well. The RSS, you're saying, is particularly concerned about this element of Mr. Modi's support, who you said are drunk on their euphoria and need to be reined in and controlled. And that is part of the message you believe that is being sent when the RSS chief talks about Ahankar, when he talks about the attitude of the leaders towards their people. All of this is contained there. I think so, because to be honest, it's not only about what they do at will in terms of polarization or uh, extreme statements. They can vandalize a studio, as they did in Bhopal, where there was a film being made called Alshram, which they thought may be against Hindu interests. And the Home Minister of the State backs them, more or less. Now, this kind of lawlessness, of violence which is unchecked, of even a belief that we don't need anyone to guide us, we know what to do. This cadre, which has swelled in numbers, remember the Bajrangal is the largest growing organization within the Sangparivar. Now the RSS has used them, the BJP has used them, but the BJP has distanced itself from them when their acts are extreme and use them when they are useful. But in the process, they have finally created an entity on which they have little control. And the RSS is concerned that most of them are uh, andhabhaks of Prime Minister Modi, whom they consider a cult figure. And it is these people who trolled Mohan Bhagwat when he tried to build bridges with the Muslim community in pursuit 
of that very advice he gave, which is that of accepting diversity and of building okay. consensus. Well, once again, Pavan, your voice is fading. Please sit as close to the screen as possible. Come closer to the screen. Your voice is clearer when, yes, come as close as that. Now, the Samsung Chalak also had some very pointed things to say about Manipur. Perhaps it's the only concrete example of him referring to a specific issue. He said, this is a state that's been in turmoil for over 13 months, and we all know that Mr. Modi has simply not bothered to visit. Yet he said, and I'm quoting him, it's a duty to deal with it on priority. He said, everywhere there's social disharmony, this is not good. Wasn't that another wrap across the Prime Minister's knuckles? I think so, because uh, again, it's linked with Ahankar. Because the opposition demanded that Prime Minister Modi should visit Manipur. Prime Minister Modi did not. I'm not saying he may not have helped in trying to find a solution, but the chief minister of the state, who is a BJP chief minister, continues. Manipur is burning and burning again for over a year. And it seems to be not a matter of priority for the Prime Minister who otherwise is ubiquitous. So when the RSS is saying, what about Manipur, a border state? What have you done about it? He is commenting on this kind of uh, unproductive unilateralism. That I will do what I think I wish to do rather than focus on national priorities. Hi, I'm Karan Thapar. Over the last few years, I hope you've been watching my program, The Interview on The Wire. During that period, I've interviewed doctors, politicians, businessmen, scientists, authors, and even the occasional Nobel laureate. For me, it's been exciting. I hope it's been enjoyable for you. But these, as you know, are tough times. And if this program is going to remain bold, independent, and sometimes even defiant, then I think we need your support. At the end of the day, it's a truism, but editorial independence is best defended by the viewers. So if you would like this program to remain the way it is, forthright, outspoken, and interesting, then would you consider supporting us? All you have to do is to click on the description at the bottom. But more than anything else, I hope you will continue to watch the interview. Your viewership means an awful lot to me. Let me ask you two more questions about the entirety, not individual elements of what Mr. Bhagwat said, but the entirety of that speech. He chose to make these comments in public. He didn't drop in at seven Lok Kalyan Marg and speak privately. He didn't send a letter and advise privately. He did it in public. That was clearly a conscious decision. He wanted the RSS, he wanted the BJP. Indeed, he wanted the country to know that this message was being given. He may have done it without naming the prime minister. He may have done it subtly and carefully, but equally, he consciously chose to do it publicly. In fact, this is not the first time. You remember, Karan, at the Pran Pratishtha of the Ayodhya temple, where Prime Minister Modi was the focus of all attention. Mohan Bhagwat was also invited. And you should seriously listen to his speech again. There was no triumphalism in his speech. In his entire speech, he spoke about this temple now having been built. Sri Ram belongs to all. We should extend uh, 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 and embrace all our citizens. There should be togetherness in this country. He even quoted a line from Tulsidas, which this is a part of the stanza that describes Ram, Ram Rajya. And the telling line that he quoted was Sab nar kar par priti, that all persons will have mutual respect for each other. It was a completely different speech. So therefore, Mohan Bhagwat chooses the occasion, or the RSS does. And when they speak in public, it is with a purpose. 
Otherwise, these consultations are behind the screen. Now, the second thing is that Mohan Bhagwat was no doubt the most prominent RSS person to speak publicly last week. He is, after all, the Sang Sang Chalak. But he wasn't by any means the only one. You mentioned Ratan Sharda, who's an intellectual for the RSS, who wrote in the RSS magazine organizer, and his was a pretty direct and comprehensive critique of the BJP campaign. But there was a third person. There was the senior RSS leader, Indresh Kumar, who said, and I'm quoting him, the party who did bhakti of Lord Ram and became arrogant was stopped at 240. He added, the vote and the power that they should have been given was stopped by God due to arrogance. Later, Mr. Indresh Kumar may have withdrawn what he said, but he said it nonetheless, and it is a pretty stinging critique of the BJP and I presume the Prime Minister. This means three voices from within the RSS chose to speak almost simultaneously. Can that be a coincidence? Or is that a conscious, deliberate message being sent by the RSS, perhaps at multiple levels to the government and the Prime Minister? No, I think what it makes obvious is that within the RSS and many sections of the BJP, I dare say, there is a strong feeling that the kind of uh, uh, one rule, one man rule within the BJP has become unproductive for the party's long-term interests. You know, when you sideline someone like Shivraj Singh Chauhan in Madhya Pradesh, summarily, you lose support among your core voters. When you uh, deal carelessly, perhaps, with Vasundra Raja in Rajasthan, you are alienating senior leaders. There is another way of handling them, even if you don't want to make them the chief. When you dismiss entire cabinets overnight of BJP ruled states, appoint somebody new. When you don't go and meet the farmers who are on your borders of the capital for one year with humility, with the idea to resolve a situation. When you pass a landmark law without in the belief of many adequate consultation within one hour by voice, voice vote, like the farm laws of the past. It is ultimately a consequence of that same unilateralism based on the assumption that I am right and that I will not bend even if that increases my stature. So it's beneath, in a sense, my dignity. I, I, can, I add with the farmers. can I add this? If the RSS is resenting and objecting to the attitude of I am right, the I is Narendra Modi. They may not well, name him, but the attitude, the behavior, and the entire manner of the Prime Minister has begun to get stuck in their throat. Well, I don't know if I'll go that far. The BJP and RSS, as I began by saying, are joined at the hip. They may resolve their difference. The ultimate may happen. Narendra Modi may change. He has occasionally shown signs of extreme versatility, like the manner in which he hugged Nitish Kumar and Chandra Babu Naidu. However, I think it reflects a general opinion, and here I'm saying something new, cutting across the BJP and the RSS. When J.P. Nadda says, during the elections, we don't need the RSS. We have become strong enough. When we were weak, we needed them. What do you think is the impact on RSS cadres? Can the BJP win one election without the help of the RSS cadres on the ground? So therefore, I think this is a cautionary voice for the current government, for Prime Minister Modi, some of his more zealous acolytes, that it is time for introspection, for course correction, 
for adjusting according to the new circumstances. Because RSS thinks long term, BJP thinks from election to election. Let me then ask you this. If this is a cautionary voice, what happens if Narendra Modi doesn't heed it? When he's been Chief Minister of Gujarat for 12 years, he frequently not only disregarded the RSS, but held them very much at arm's length. I know he's a weaker prime minister now. I know he needs support in a way he didn't when he was in Gujarat. But he can also be a pretty difficult person to change. So if he doesn't heed this cautionary voice, how do you see the relationship with Mohan Bhagwat developing over the months and years ahead? Can you hear me, Karan? Yes. Did you not hear my question? No. Can you repeat that, please? Yeah, I'll repeat the question. I hear you say, Pavan Varma, that the RSS Sangsar Chalak's message was a cautionary voice. A voice that was telling Mr. Modi, you need to change, you need to adapt, you need to find new and different ways of doing things. The old ways cannot continue. But you know and I know that during the 12 years he was Chief Minister of Gujarat, Mr. Modi not only disregarded the RSS, he kept them at very much an arm's length. If that attitude continues, even though he may be a weaker Prime Minister today, how do you see the relationship with Mr. Bhagwat developing over the next months and years? I can't speculate. I can't speculate, uh, Karan, because Mr. Modi is still by far the most popular leader in India. But I can say this with some degree of certainty in terms of my own assessment, that Mr. Modi is not temperamentally geared to be a leader who has to build a consensus. In Gujarat, not only did he run the government with uh, little or no consensus. He had a running fight with a very strong and upcoming leader of the RSS who had to finally leave the state. And you know who I'm referring to. Absolutely. Mr. So, uh, yeah. And so in, in, in Delhi also, uh, there are... Uh, there has been no reason for him to find a consensus. So then tell, I mean, me, you know, that, tell me if that attitude continues after last Monday's speech, what sort of relationship would he have with Mr. Bhagwat? Well, you know, I, I, I believe that the RSS uh, sees its core Hindutva agenda with some degree of great calibration. It doesn't take hasty decisions. So what does that mean? Because what does that mean? It means that it means that they will wait and watch. They will see how Mr. Modi fares, how the allies are behaving, what are the consequences that unfold in the parliament, what is the progress in making laws when with a much stronger opposition that has had 10 years of being ridden roughshod, how will they oppose? What are the abilities of this government to build a consensus across the treasury benches? There and, are things that the RSS is, will watch. In, in other words, the RSS is prepared to give Mr. Modi more time. I think so. I okay. think so because the critical thing are the three assembly elections that are coming. What happens if BJP Karan, loses? Them? What happens if BJP loses them? Karan, it's for you and I to speculate. But if the BJP does not win two out of the three, and uh, if they lose all three or win only one, uh, there could be voices. Okay. Perhaps. Let's leave it there, Pavan Varma. From within the beach. Let's leave it there. You're reluctant to speculate further. I don't want to push you. 
because it will diminish the impact of what you've said. I'd rather the audience remembered your interpretation and your analysis of the message that was being given in that speech by the Sang Sang Chalak to the Prime Minister and his government. That is the key focus of our discussion today. I thank you for the time you've made available. Take care. Stay safe. Michael. Hi, I'm Karan Thapar. Over the last few years, I hope you've been watching my program, The Interview on the Wire. During that period, I've interviewed doctors, politicians, businessmen, scientists, authors, and even the occasional Nobel laureate. For me, it's been exciting. I hope it's been enjoyable for you. But these, as you know, are tough times. And if this program is going to remain bold, independent, and sometimes even defiant, then I think we need your support. At the end of the day, it's a truism, but editorial independence is best defended by the viewers. So if you would like this program to remain the way it is, forthright, outspoken, and interesting, then would you consider supporting us? All you have to do is to click on the description at the bottom. But more than anything else, I hope you will continue to watch the interview. Your viewership means an awful lot to me.